We're going to talk about arrays and how they're represented internally in memory. So just to refresh your memory and see, an array is declared uh, like this. We define the, the, uh, the type, T, uh, and then we give the array a name. Here it's just called A, and then we say how many elements are in the array. We're going to start out by just talking about single dimensional arrays. So the meaning of that declaration is here. It says that we have L elements of type T. And we're going to see that those are going to be contiguously allocated in memory. So one element right after the other in an array. We can tell how many bytes are actually allocated for the entire array uh, using a formula like this. We take L, the number of elements in the array, times the size of T, which is the type of each element. So it's not the number of bytes in the array, it's the size of each of those elements times the number of elements. That gives us the overall number of bytes that are being stored by the array itself. And here are some examples. Um, we have a character array called foo that has 12 characters in it. We've got an integer array called bar that has five integers in it. Remember that that count is the number of elements. So here's similarly three longs. And here we've got a pointer to a character, in an array of those called quux, that has three of those elements. So if we think about this last one, we know that each of the char stars is going to be eight bytes because that's the size of a pointer on a 64-bit machine times three which is going to give us 24 total bytes for the size of this entire array so here's uh, some illustrations of how these things are actually allocated in storage so for this array uh, called foo it's an array of 12 chars and we can see that uh, here in this diagram I'm showing each of these boxes is of is one byte in size so we can see that there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 bytes that are stored there in memory. So again, these are going to be located contiguously in RAM with no uh, additional gaps or anything like that between them. Um, when we're referencing this in terms of the array notation in C, shown up here, we can see that foo of 0 is going to point to this very first character, this very first byte in the array, foo of 1 the second byte, foo of 2 the next one, all the way up to foo 11, which is going to refer to the last byte in the array. So using that notation uh, is quite common and convenient, but we can also refer to these as pointers. So if we have a pointer to the beginning of foo, like we've got here with x, uh, that's going to also refer to the zeroth element of that array. And we'll see that a pointer really is just the address of the zeroth element in an array. And if we want to refer to a location, for example, one beyond the end of the array, we can just add the array size to that original pointer. So x plus 12 will actually refer to this byte, which is one past the end of the array. Similarly for an array of integers, we've now got a bar, or an array called bar that's got five integers, which are going to be indexed bar of zero through bar of four, right? The fifth, the zeroth one to the fifth one. And because integers on a 64-bit machine are 32 bits wide, we know that this is going to be uh, starting at address x, which is going to be the, the, the location of the very first byte of this array. So that's going to be right here, right? that very first zeroth byte. And then the, those four bytes, if we go back here and sort of split this guy up into its constituent bytes, we can see that those bytes are going to store the first integer. And then the second integer, which is be, going to be at bar plus 1, is going to be stored starting at x plus 4, the next one at x plus 8, the next one at x plus 12, and so forth to the end of the array. For a long, it's going to be similar, except now we've got 8 bytes per element. So the size of long is 8. And we can see here that baz of 0 goes from the beginning of the array to just before x plus 8, which is where the second element starts, and so forth. And finally, for a character pointer, um, we know that these things are also 64 bits or 8 bytes wide. So quux of 0 starts at the beginning, and then quux of 1 is going to start at x plus 8, quux of 2 at x plus 16, and so forth. Okay, let's look how we access arrays. Again, the declaration, this template declaration, is saying that we have an array of type T. Each of the elements are going to be are going to be T's. The array itself is called A, and it's going to have L elements. And currently, again, we're talking about single-dimensional arrays. We'll come to multi-dimensional arrays later. The basic principle here is really key. The idea is that A, the name of the array, 
uh, as we see up here. A is going to be a pointer of type T star. So the type of A is actually a T star. And A itself refers to the very beginning of the array. In other words, it contains the address of the first element of the array. And that's what's illustrated down here in our uh, sample declaration. We've got this array called bar. It's of type int. So each of the uh, elements uh, in the array are going to be integers. They're going to be four bytes wide. And there's going to be a total of five of them. This basic principle tells us that bar's type is actually an int star. So it's as if we've defined bar in that fashion instead of as an array with five elements. That's going to be its type. When we refer to bar with the, at the indexing operator, that's basically saying give me the, f the, the nth value at that location uh, of the integers that bar points to. So if we look at this example of bar of 3, we know that, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, what we're going to show here is the, uh, the address of each of these elements in the, um, in the array. So x itself is going to point to the very first element of the array. So remember that because these are 4-byte elements, we've got 4 bytes in here, 1, 2, 3, 4, that store that first integer. Back those out so we can see the value. And then the next integer begins four bytes later in memory at x plus four. So whatever x is, wherever the compilers decided to store this array in memory, we know that the first element is going to be at that location. That's also going to be the value of bar itself. It's a pointer to an integer that refers to that very first array element. And then the subsequent values are going to appear four bytes later uh, for each of the elements that are stored in the array. So if we're looking at uh, this this uh, C expression, bar of 3, we know that, that this array starts at bar of 0, bar of 1, 2, and then 3. So we know that the, the third element of the array, or the one at index 3, is going to be right here. It's going to start at x plus 12. Because we're dereferencing this, this uh, bar reference by putting in the array uh, index of 3, we know that what we're going to get back from that is going to be the integer that's at that fourth location in the array. So the type of that expression is going to be an integer, and it's got as a value the value 8, this uh, integer that we fished out of that location in the array itself. If we think about just bar, I've already given away the answer here, bar is actually an int star. It's a pointer to an integer. That's just by this basic definition that we've got going on here that says a is a pointer of type t star to the first element of the array. So the type of this guy is going to be an int star, What's its value going to be? Well, it's a pointer, right? And we've already said that the, uh, the uh, contents of this uh, array is going to be stored starting at some address x. So that's actually going to be the value that is stored at bar. It's going to be x. Now, when we do arithmetic on pointers, remember that bar, although it looks like this goofy erase thing, under the hood, it's really actually this. It's an int star, right? That's, that's a pointer of type t star. When we do arithmetic on pointers, when we're adding and subtracting uh, values f uh, from, with pointers, we're actually going to be incrementing and decrementing values according to the size of the fundamental data type, right? So when we say bar plus 1, we're saying give me the next integer after where bar points. So bar plus 1 in this case is actually going to be, um, well, first of all, its type is going to be what? That's an, another int star. It's We're doing pointer arithmetic. So we take a pointer, we add 1 to it. We don't actually get the address plus 1 necessarily. We get the address plus the number of bytes in each of the elements that are stored at bar. So its value is actually going to be this pointer, x plus 4. Similarly, if we say bar plus 2, well, uh, when we say that we're adding 2 to a pointer, we're really adding 2 times the size of each of the things that are in the array. So this is going to, again, be an int star, and it's going to now be x plus 8. How about this? Address of bar of 2. Well, bar of 2, right, we know that if we just take that portion first, we know that the bar of, bar of 2 is, so here's bar of 0, bar of 1, bar of 2. That's this guy, it's this element of the array, 
and we're asking for its address. Well, we know that from this diagram that the address is going to be x plus 8. What's going to be the type of that thing? Well, it's a pointer to an integer, uh, and its value is going to be x plus 8. Notice that these two expressions refer to the same thing. So bar plus 2 is the same thing as the address of bar of 2. Right, they both give us back a pointer to an integer that is the address of that value of the array that's at index number 2. <coughs> so this is using the address of operator. We can also use the dereference operator, right? We saw earlier that bar of 1 is itself a pointer to an integer, right? It's this value x plus 4 up here. Uh, and when we dereference that, when we take or apply the star to it, we're saying basically, I want to know that what's, what is the thing that's pointed to by this address? Well, first of all, it's type. This is an address, bar plus 1. So this is an, an address. It's an int star. Uh, and we're taking the thing that's at that int star. So this is going to be the int that's at that location. So its type is int. And its value is going to be the thing that's stored there, the integer that's stored there. So its value is going to be 6 corresponding to the element at bar plus 1 or index 1. In general, bar plus i, any for any integer i, is going to be an integer pointer, right? It's going to be just, let's start at bar, which is here at x, and then we're going to add the value of i times the size of each of the elements in the array. So here's bar plus 1, bar plus 2, bar plus 3. And it's going to refer basically to the ith element of the array, or the address of the ith element, right? So it's going to be the base pointer x, this guy up here, plus the size of each of the elements times the value of i that we're adding to the base address. Now this is an important uh, expression to keep in mind uh, because we're going to be able to use this pretty well directly in the assembly language. It's going to give us access to the contents of that array. Bar of 5 then, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Well, what does that even mean to talk about bar of 5? Uh, it turns out that the C compiler is perfectly happy to allow us to access bar of 5. Um, the fact that there are there isn't a, a, an index 5 in this array, right? That's we're sort of referencing memory off the end of the array at this point, which is dangerous, but the compiler does not prevent us from doing that. Uh, well, we know that bar uh, with an index attached to it is going to give us an integer, so it's going to refer to an integer. What's the value of the integer going to be? We have no idea. It's actually going to be whatever happens to be stored in these next four bytes of memory, but that isn't something that we've actually given a value to yet, right? So keep in mind that when uh, C lets you refer to values in memory through pointers or through arrays, that there is no, um, there's no um, uh, safety net going on in C at all. It's perfectly happy to let you access a completely bogus element of that array uh, and give you back that value. And that's a source for quite a lot of um, exploits in the security community uh, and an endless source of delightful bugs uh, in the development community. Okay, here's another uh, example of some additional arrays. Um, first of all, just some, some C coding up here. Um, who we're using sharp define to just uh, give us uh, a, a constant that we can reuse. So Z length, these are zip codes. Uh, Z length of five, because we're going to use five digit zip codes. And here you can see um, uh, we're defining an array. Here's one called Taylor University, and here's our zip code. Uh, but these are now of type zip dig or zip code digits. Uh, what we're doing here is we're using a type def. So this is, um, again, you've seen these before in C. But this is kind of a convenient way to uh, annotate uh, or to declare variables that don't um, uh, that don't have a simple form. So what we're saying here when we say type def uh, uh, int zip digit of zlen, that's an array declaration, right? Um, but what it also does, because it's part of a type def, is it creates a new identifier called zip did. The idea here in the syntax for type defs in C is that we're creating essentially a declaration or we're creating a type by giving what the declaration would look like and then it adds uh, 
uh, an identifier called zipdig that we can use later on. So by saying zipdig of TU, zipdig of MIT, zipdig of UCB, we're actually defining or declaring three different arrays, all of which are going to have this underlying structure. They're going to be an integer with z-len elements in the, or an integer array with z-length elements in them. And then we're using the standard C initialization syntax to give these initial values. So what we see then is in, in memory, and let's just assume again arbitrarily that this the first of these arrays was allocated at address 16. That's actually far too low an address for an actual uh, uh, runtime in, in Unix, but let's just assume that that's where things get put. We can see that we've got four byte pieces here, that four, four bytes between each of these addresses, and the values from the initialization uh, get stored in those locations, 4, 6, 9, 8, 9, corresponding to those values up here. Now, <clears throat> what I'm showing here is that these three arrays are going to be allocated contiguously in memory. That's kind of what I'm suggesting up here, that we're allocating them in successive bytes of 20, or su successive blocks of 20 bytes. That is not guaranteed by the compiler, but it would be one way that the compiler would be willing to allocate storage. Uh, so what we'd see then, uh, if that was the way, if this was the way that the compiler was allocating these things, we'd see that at the next consecutive address, address 36 here, we would find the digits for the CMU array and then the digits for the MIT array. Okay. Now let's think about what kind of assembly language has to be in place here to access these guys. So again, we're going to reuse this zip dig um, type def that we had from before. So here it is again. Uh, we're saying zip dig is going to be an identifier that is now going to be a name of a type that declares an array of zlen integers. And here's a little function. We want to get a particular digit from one of these arrays uh, that are of type zip dig or an integer array. So in the first parameter to this function, we're defining zip dig uh, in a, a variable called z, which is going to basically be the pointer to the beginning of one of those arrays. And then <coughs> um, we also want to figure out, well, which digit do we want to get from there? So this is going to be something between 0 and 4, although if we give it a bogus value, C is perfectly happy to give us bogus data. Uh, but if we're doing it properly, this should be in the range of 0 to 4, or 0 to z length in this particular case. And all this thing is going to do is um, give us back the, the digit element of the array z. Um, so again, if we pass it um, the, uh, the address of this tu array, what we're going to do is we're going to start from, so that, that again, because the array itself is a pointer to the first element of the array, it's going to have that address in it. And then when we <coughs> uh, in, index into that with digit, it's going to skip forward digit times the size of each of those, times the size of each of those elements, so 4, 8, 12, and so forth, and give us back the value that's stored there. So it's going to give back uh, 4 if we pass in a 0, 6 if we pass in a 1 as the, the value of this digit. Well, how does the <coughs> assembler arrange for that to happen? Well. Uh, we know, for example, or for, to start with, that the value that's going to become coming back from this function is going to be stored in the A register. Um, so that's what we're trying to store a value into. And we can use this, uh, this addressing mode specifically designed to make this easier uh, in the following way. We're going to start out by saying, well, RDI. Well, what's RDI? Remember from before we were talking about how we pass parameters into functions. So the first parameter of the function, get digit, will have been stored in RDI, right? Here's my little cheat sheet. RDI is going to be basically Z. It's going to be the starting address of the array. And then RSI is the standard place for the compiler to arrange to store the second parameter of an array, uh, sorry, of a function. Uh, so RSI is going to have the value of digit in it. So the syntax again, here's our, um, Here's our base register, right? That's the first parameter. Our index register, that's the second parameter. And then our scale factor, which you'll recall has to be 1, 2, 4, or 8 only. We're saying basically start at the base register, start at whatever RDI is, which we know is going to basically point to this first location, right? That's what's in 
RDI. It refers to that same location. Our SI is our index, right? It's going to be the value of the digit. And what we're going to do is take RDI plus RSI times 4, right? That's what this construct does, multiplies the index register times the scale factor. So for every uh, si single or every value of RSI, we're going to multiply that times 4. So if RSI comes in as 0, we're going to multiply 0 times 4 and add that to our DI, the base register, and end up pointing right here. Whereas if our SI, for example, is 3, we're going to take 3 times 4, get 12, and add that to our DI. So here's plus 4, plus 8, plus 12. In that case, the resulting address would refer to this location in the array. And what we would be storing into the A register would be the value that's stored right here. So as we mentioned before, this addressing mode is built, well, for among other things, it's built specifically to make it easy to access an array. And a very common pattern is what's shown right here. There's the beginning of the array corresponding to Z itself. Here's the index value, an integer from 0 to 1 minus the length of the array if we're doing it properly, so from 0 to Z len in this case. And this guy is going to be the size of each of the elements in the array. In this case, it's 4 because we're dealing with integers, which are, of course, 4 bytes. If we had defined uh, zip dig to be uh, of type long, then the compiler would have generated a value of 8 here because each of those longs occupies 8 bytes. So instead of skipping forward by 4, we'd want to skip forward by 8. All right, let's look here at a little bit more elaborate example of accessing an array and how the C code is translated into assembly language. So here we've got a function called z increment. Uh, its job basically is going to be to take each of the digits in this zip dig array. Remember, this is just an array of five integers, and we're going to call it z inside this function. Uh, we want to add one to each of those values. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is, well, and this is going to take place inside of a for loop. Uh, so we're going to start with an index i at 0, and we're going to go for i uh, up to one less than the length of the array, so from zero to four, and then auto increment each time through the loop. One thing that's uh, maybe new to some of you here is that the declaration of i is this size underscore t. That's actually gonna be uh, a declaration that's um, made in one of the standard C library uh, header files that says, well, what's gonna be our fundamental size uh, uh, type? It's probably some sort of an unsigned but it's quite common to see this, this kind of a syntax where we have the underscore, or the underscore t at the end as an indication that this is a kind of a machine size specific type. Um, so you could think of this as just an unsigned int, basically, and it's going to vary from machine to machine, but that's why we have these kind of conventional names for things like a size of something. Okay, the business end of this then is basically to just uh, add one to each of the elements of z. So referring to z of i, which is um, just the conventional mechanism for referring to the ith element of z, and whatever is in that location, we're going to increment it by 1 using the standard um, post increment uh, uh, operator in c. Okay, so let's look at the assembly language. Uh, well, first, let's take a peek at the use of registers here. We know because we're passing in a, f a value to this function that this is going to be stored in RDI by the caller. So RDI has the starting address of the array. Remember that the array itself is actually a pointer to the type of the elements in the array, and its value is going to be initialized to the address of the zeroth element, the beginning of the array. So um, we're going to uh, use that as our, uh, our base, and then we also are going to have to have some sort of an index here as we go over this loop. Turns out that the compiler in this case has decided to use as its index the A register. Well, why does it choose to do that? Um, sometimes its behavior is a little bit mysterious, but at the very least, uh, we know, for example, that because this is a void function, that we're not going to return a value from this, this array. So that being the case, we're free to use A for other purposes. In this particular case, it's going to be the array index. So we're going to initialize it by moving the value 0, remember the dollar sign means a constant value, into the A register, uh, which is the equivalent of this initialization step of i equals 0. 
Um, this is uh, the compiler chosen to use a jump to the middle implementation for this for loop. So remember that when we uh, are using a for, we want to check to see that the termination condition hasn't yet been um, met at the very first in, uh, uh, invocation of the loop. So we're going to jump to dot L3. So here's dot L3. This is going to be where we're going to compare to see if we've finished going through the loop. Uh, so uh, the dollar four here is the, 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 uh, the index of the last element of the array. Remember that the arrays go from zero to five or excuse me, from 0 to 4 because it's a 5-element array. So what we want to do is check to see if our index, A, the A register, is in excess of 4. Because if it is, we're done. Uh, so we do the comparison. Remember, that's going to do an implicit subtraction behind the scenes. It's just going to set the condition codes based on the relative values of these two variables, or the <laughs> variables of this register and this constant. And if it's below or equal, we're going to jump to L4. So we're saying if the A register is less than or equal to 4, we want to go and do the body of the loop, which starts here at the .L4 label. Uh, if it's not below or equal to 4, we're going to return back to the caller because we're now done doing what we were supposed to be doing. Notice that at that point, A is going to have some value corresponding to the, the current value of I at the time that it exits the loop, probably a 5. Um, and although A does have a 5 in it, this is not going to be something that the caller is going to make any use of because this is a void function. It's declared to not to return any value. So although the A register will have some value in it when the return takes place, uh, the caller isn't going to make any use of that because the function itself is declared to return a void. Okay, so that's the initial check for the termination condition. So the first time through this loop, um, uh, we're gonna, we'll are gonna we have initialized i to 0, right, which we did here. We jump down to L3, compare to see if it's, um, or compare it to the value 4. It's going to be less than 4, so we're going to jump here to the body of the loop. Now, what we're trying to do here is increment the value that's stored at z of i. So... First of all, we're going to we're going to do an add instruction. We're going to add one to this value, and what's the location of the value where we're going to add to? Well, again, in this case, we're using the uh, the addressing mode that allows us to have the base register, the index register, and the scale factor. RDI here, we know that RDI refers to the starting address of the array. It's what Z gets stored into as the first parameter to this function. So that's the base register. A is the current index that we're working on as we iterate over this for loop. And then 4 is the size of each of the elements in the array. So this is going to go to the base of the array and add to it the index i times 4, which will give us the address of the rax element of the array. And it's going to add 1 to that location. Then we've got a... In, we've got a uh, deal with the the um, the increment operation here. That's going to take going to move the the loop forward. All we got to do because we've stored i in the a register is just do an add instruction with a constant of one and add that to the a register. And then we're going to try the comparison again, right? Because we need to check to see when does a get larger than the maximum number of elements in the array. And eventually, as we continue to loop through here, this will um, this will give us a value that causes the below equal jump to fail, and we'll drop through to the return statement. Again, just to kind of clarify where these pieces and parts are coming from, um, i itself is the a register, and the i equal to zero is what's implemented right here. The comparison with z len is taking place in these two instructions. Here's the actual comparison, and here's where we uh, where we uh, jump if the condition still holds. The increment of i itself is right here. We're just adding 1 to the a register. And then the body of the loop, that whole, uh, whole statement, is implemented by a single assembly language statement that adds 1 to the appropriate element. And the only remaining statement here that we haven't talked about uh, is the jump instruction that just does our jump to the middle at the very beginning of the execution of this function.